Good evening, start everybody, and welcome to this evening's event uh, from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. Uh, my name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum here, and it's okay. great to have you with us. Whether you are here in person in this wonderful Frank Pan Hall, do come on in, um, or whether you're watching us online in whichever She's country a, you are. One of the things we've learnt post-pandemic is that we can actually reach out well beyond uh, Cambridge, uh, and we've had people from about 130 different countries uh, come along to our events. I don't know whether we've, we're adding to that number tonight. Um, some of you will know Jesus College very well, but for some of you, this may be your first time here, again, for real or virtually. Um, we have an amazing history. Um, originally set up when a group of itinerant nuns were given a small plot of land by the then Bishop of Ely in 1144. Uh, that was expanded when King Malcolm of Scotland gave some more land to the nuns in 1156. And it continued as a very successful nunnery uh, for quite a long time. Actually, somewhat related um, to the talk tonight, the oldest tree, I believe, in the college grounds uh, is a sort of fairly small one, but it produced berries which could be used by the nuns to induce abortions. So perhaps the role of nun was slightly different uh, a few hundred <laughs> years ago uh, than what we may think of now. In 1496, the then Bishop of Ely um, said there were only two nuns left. One was rather elderly and the other was ill-famed, so he kicked them all out and turned it into an all-male college, something I'm pleased to say we have now rectified several decades ago. Um, but it's been an amazing place with a real affinity for thought and for changing the world, with alumni from Cranmer, uh, who changed religion, Malthus, whose thoughts about population have been really influential. More recently, the wonderful Lisa Jardine, who was a brilliant Renaissance English scholar and also chair of the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority, showing that you can actually study English and science and really make a difference. Uh, even more recently, does anybody know Clean Bandit? Mm, Good, yeah. fantastic. Uh, Rockaby, you know, has been watched, uh, downloaded well over a billion times. They were oh, all here uh, and produced that here. So we have, oh, wow. um, I think, three yeah. Nobel Prizes and okay. at least one very successful band. So it's that something. <coughs> um, the Intellectual Forum was set up uh, only a few years ago, and our aim is to do the sorts of event we're doing tonight, to try to reach out beyond our own academic community. So we have lots of discussions, events, conversations. We've had speakers from Jimmy Chu uh, through oh. to um, uh, Helen Clark, who used to run New Zealand <coughs> and then UNDP, many, many others. I could give you a very long list, but even better, you could have a look at our YouTube channel where most of those events are listed and you can watch them again. Um, you can also, after uh, in a couple of days' time, watch this one again if you missed anything because you were paying so much attention uh, as we went along. And tonight's event is a really interesting and highly topical uh, discussion. I'm really pleased that we're talking about it because while we've seen in the US lots of discussion <laughs> about the law about abortion, there was a sense until quite recently there was just an acceptance that it, w it was settled, uh, that abortion was legal. Actually, very few people until recently, I think, knew about Northern Ireland as an exception. And I think very few people indeed knew, know about the fact that abortion is, in fact, not legal uh, in England and Wales. The, the Abortion Act did not quite go that far, and we're going to explore that and where that might go. And there's also a lot more to say about other aspects of violence against women and girls, and I'm not going to uh, preempt everything that is said tonight. But there is a huge amount to discuss, and I'm really pleased we've got you here uh, for this discussion. Not just have we got you here, but we have two absolutely brilliant people here to lead that conversation. We'll have a conversation between them before we move over uh, to other conversations. Um, and I, I wouldn't normally use my phone here, but I want to get all the quotes exactly right about how they've been described. So um, <laughs> Char Charlotte Proudman was described by the BBC as the feminist barrister, you know, well enough. The Telegraph said that she is clever, confident, and impressively well-versed on women's rights. Not just well-versed, but impressively so. Um, and again, you, you can interpret that as you like. She's... Um, got an academic background at King's College and then, you know, quite sensibly moving to a more um, female-named college at Queen's, uh, where she was a fellow, did her doctorate in FGM. Um, Charlotte, there's so much you're doing. It's wonderful to have you, you here. So I don't know if you want to come and, and towards your, your seat. And it's also great to have Lakshmi Sundaram, who... And I've known both these people for a ridiculously long time in some, <laughs> some senses. Um, but Lakshmi and I were only a year apart as students, um, which I don't know what that says about our ages, but I should move on quickly. Um, and she's also done a huge number of things. Uh, with Co-Impact, she was the first executive director of Girls Not Brides, a global partnership to end child marriage, and grew that absolutely massively. She was also uh, in charge of Open Democracy, a really fantastic publication platform. So Lakshmi, it's great to have you with us as well. So you also want to come up. 
Um, and uh, I will now hand over to the two of you to take us through the rest of this. I will only intervene, I hope, um, when we have questions from online. So I'll let you know when those questions come on. And if you are online, please use the Q&A feature. Lakshmi, Charlotte, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Julian, for that very generous introduction. Um, we're really pleased to, to be here with all of you to, today. And I'm absolutely delighted to talk about this important topic with, uh, with Charlotte. Um, when we spoke um, a few weeks ago about how, what we'd want to focus on here, um, as you can imagine, the, the issue of abortion in the US came up. Um, as you probably will have heard, um, there was a, a big strike down of one of the fundamental Supreme Court rulings in the United States, um, a ruling called Roe v. Wade, uh, earlier in June, which has really fundamentally shifted the way that people are thinking about abortion, talking about abortion in the United States context. And that has started to prompt conversations in a whole range of other countries where we started to look at our own context and think about, huh, could something like that happen here as well? And just to set the scene a little bit about why the, this was such a seismic shift in the, in the United States, this ruling, Roe v. Wade, uh, is from 1973 and uh, where the Supreme Court um, recognized that a right to abortion was enshrined in the United States Constitution. Um, this right was then reinforced by another ruling in, um, I think, 1992, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And for a lot of people, that was, that was in some way uh, a, a landmark ruling that, felt, that made people feel that this was settled. We could think, focus on other issues because there, here was this landmark ruling. What that meant was there were all these state-level laws on the books that date from the 30s that actually um, don't give women the right to, to an abortion, um, but they were superseded by this, the Supreme Court ruling. And there were efforts afoot to nibble away, nibble away um, at the the practical aspects um, of uh, being able to, to get an abortion uh, in different states. But still, for most people who care about sexual reproductive rights, there was this feeling that this Supreme Court ruling would hold us, uh, would, would protect this, this right, even if all these, these little things were, were happening. Then when, when it became clear that um, there was a possibility that Roe would fall, it really felt that there was a, a seismic shift in people's feelings about abortion. Suddenly this thing that many people my age had grown up thinking of as an, a normal, undeniable right was toppled and a large number of states had trigger laws that meant that the moment the Supreme Court ruling fell, that um, the right to abortion for women in those, in those states also fell. All, all of that to set the scene a little bit for our discussion today, where we're going to focus on what the situation is here in the, in the UK, because when, when we were chatting, we, we realized that Lots of people here, when hearing about the news from the US, reacted with a, oh my, that's really awful that that's happening there. Thank goodness we live here. Thank goodness our rights are protected here. But Charlotte, you're going to tell us a little bit about why that may not actually be the case. Yeah, so I, I think that one of the um, greatest myths, uh, particularly concerning abortion in this country, is the fact that abortion is legal, it is decriminalized. Um, and in fact, we know that in England, Wales, and Scotland, abortion continues to be regulated through the law. And as a family law barrister, I've worked on a number of cases in which reproductive control and coercion has been a, a really s significant issue at the heart of that case, either through preventing women from having access to reproductive health care, 
um, or indeed encouraging them or, or even coercing them to have abortions. And so as I began to dig a little bit deeper into abortion rights um, in Britain, um, I was shocked, staggered to discover that under the Offences Against the Person Act um, 1861, um, abortion continues to be a criminal offence. In fact, women can be kept in servitude for attempting to procure their own abortion. So by, for example, ordering abortion pills online, some people may not know that is a crime, a woman could spend her life in prison. And you may think, well, surely 1861, that was before the light bulb was invented. It was before women even had the right to vote. You know, women couldn't even go into the House of Commons. They were not part of drafting this law or even implementing it, yet it still continues to be enforced today. Now, it, it really is enforced today. There are two women on trial for abortion-related offences. There's a woman on trial in Stoke-on-Trent, and there's a woman on trial in Oxford. Uh, of course, there's a significant issue there around, well, is there a public interest in prosecuting these women? And in fact, these two women that are on trial at the moment are not just the only women that have been prosecuted and indeed in other cases convicted. So there were 17 women that were investigated by the police in eight years for abortion-related offences. In fact, it's thought to be a lot higher than that, but not all police constabularies responded to that freedom of information request. And um, just in 2019, um, a woman um, who ordered abortion pills online, uh, who thought she was only around eight to ten weeks uh, gone, in fact took those abortion pills. And the reason she did so is that she asserted that she had been in an abusive relationship and was coerced by her boyfriend to take those tablets. As a result, uh, she found herself in a bath in an inch of blood uh, she was rushed to hospital, and when she was in hospital, the police arrived, and she was investigated, she was prosecuted, and she was convicted, and she spent two years in prison as a result of that. Um, just last year, uh, there was a 15-year-old girl who was studying for her GCSEs. Uh, she was pregnant. Uh, the school were involved in this. She didn't want to tell her family members for various reasons. And um, she said that she had a miscarriage. Uh, the police were then alerted, and she was investigated. The police arrived at her property. Her family, therefore, knew that she uh, had been pregnant. And uh, they took her laptop. They took her phone, um, as I say, during her GCSE period. So even more traumatic than perhaps it would have otherwise been. Again, a 15-year-old girl who was suffering as a result of that from uh, what she describes as trauma. Um, very heavy-handed approach. Um, another woman, um, just last year, she was um, investigated after she said that she had a miscarriage. Uh, in fact, they thought that she tried to procure her own abortion. She was spent over 30 hours in a prison cell, um, and she is still being investigated uh, by the police. Um, and although initially the CPS decided that there was um, no public interest in prosecuting her case, the police asked again for the CPS to relook at that, to review the case. Uh, and so she continues through that process, um, again, a significant period of time later. These are just some of the examples, and of course there are, there are many more, and I'll just tell you um, about uh, one other woman who... Um, she, had, um, she was very vulnerable. She had a history of mental health. Um, she had been prosecuted for, again, attempting to procure her own abortion. And while she was at court, um, she actually collapsed. Um, and she was then sentenced to over two and a half years in prison. That was in 2015. And it's almost impossible to know how many cases um, have been prosecuted, how many have resulted in a conviction, in terms of actually knowing the stories, who these women are or girls are behind these cases, despite the fact, of course, there are many organisations working in this sector, gathering this data, gathering this information, working as advocacy tools to further the rights of women and girls to access reproductive health care. So there's an enormous question around the criminalisation of women. And, and just to add, um, so that... So of course, the Offences Against the Person Act. There have been another uh, 
various other pieces of legislation, but the one that's primarily used when women um, or girls seek access to abortion is the Abortion Act 1967. Um, and that, in effect, partially uh, decriminalized abortion, that abortion continues to be highly regulated. Um, so to have an abortion, you need two doctors that certify the abortion, and it has to be on stringent grounds. So, for example, because it's necessary for your physical or your mental health, so it could result in immediate or permanent injury. So what happens is that many women who go to a doctor and seek an abortion, they have to pathologize themselves. They have to come up with a mental health justification as to why they want to have an abortion. And one woman that I'm working with now, with another law firm, we're looking at bringing a Human Rights Act challenge, McAllister and Olivieris, to the Abortion Act, uh, is on the basis that she had gone along and she said, I wanted an abortion because I don't want to have children. I want to live my life child-free. It's a decision that I've made. I'm a woman in my 40s. I've always, well, never wanted to have children. And so she articulated her reasons, and she was told that that was not a valid legal justification to have an abortion. And so she had to come up with a mental health reason, which would then be on her mental health uh, and medical records. Uh, and so she asserted that if she was to go through with the pregnancy and have this child, it would cause her uh, really serious harm to her mental health, emotional, physical uh, well-being. And as a result, then she uh, had an abortion. But one can see the difficulties around this, particularly when looking, as I say, about the pathologization of women and seeing that they're not making a free, independent choice they're having to justify that decision or rationalize it on the basis of what men decided primarily decades ago or even centuries ago on the basis of what is a reasonable ground for a woman to make free decisions about her life and her bodily integrity. And I think these are fundamental questions that we should all be asking and thinking to ourselves about, do we want to live in a society like this where women's bodies are regulated to this extent? It's really shocking to, to hear some of, some of those stories. And uh, I mean, one of the things that I think is amazing with the work that, that you do, it's really about trying to use the law to not only bring light to these, these situations, but also change the situation for the, the women coming up behind. Can you talk a bit about, about that work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I can speak about it from this context, but I know, of course, you work globally, and it'd be really interesting to learn about some of the challenges um, and some of the ways in which you've been able to progress women's rights in other contexts. Um, but, I mean, here we've worked on a number of uh, different campaigns. Um, those that have been successful more recently um, has been to criminalise child marriage in this country, which, again, many people are surprised about the fact that that was not a criminal offence. Um, and indeed, of course, you could marry in this country at the age of 16 with parental consent. Again, people were very surprised about that, particularly when you had DFID and other government organisations going abroad and saying you need to do something about the fact that child marriage is prevalent, particularly one example was Bangladesh, and the government said, well, why don't you look at what's happening in your own country? Yeah, the, the, the work on child marriage was... It, the situation in the UK really hampered DFID's work abroad because, as you said, it, it, Bangladesh rolled back its laws on child marriage um, by using the, the UK context. The thing that was interesting um, from that campaign was that when um, both in, in the UK and uh, globally, when uh, the, there had been a number of, of amazing activists and organizations, often people who had been married young themselves, um, who were really trying to change this, the situation uh, in their communities. What really created a shift was trying to work on all of the different aspects in a sort of coordinated manner. So there were some groups that really focused on changing the law. Mm. Um, the, the legal context, the, the age of marriage, but also the, the other um, surrounding aspects that would, that would protect children when they were in a situation where they might end up being married. But then it was also working with um, activists and organizations who worked really hard on changing some of the, 
the cultural norms um, in a lot of the different contexts where child marriage was taking place and uncovering some of the, um, the negative consequences of marriage and talking much more openly about those. I mean, I remember when, um, when I started working on this, on this issue, for us, a, a huge success was if some like, important person said the words child marriage. Seven years later, there were, um, there were a number of human rights resolutions focused on child marriage. Countries around the world were starting to put in place national action plans to, to tackle this, this issue. And I think for um, initially, there was such a reticence to address what was seen as a, a cultural issue. There was a big feeling of like, oh, we shouldn't impinge, you know, this is what some cultures do, we shouldn't impinge on those. There were a lot of myths around, around child marriage and, and systematically being able to unpack the, the health implications, the fact that you know, if girls um, were pregnant under the age of, of 15, they were five times more likely to die mm. in childbirth than, than older women, that um, if girls were, were married early, they were very unlikely to finish their schooling and, and on and on and on. And, and being able to, to see that this was not just happening in places that were stereotypically felt as being the hotbeds of, of child marriage, but it was happening in the UK, it's happening in the United States, it's happening in Brazil, in Mexico, and, and it looks a bit different in all of these places, but the fact that there was a much more of an open conversation, that there was links between the people who were working on the legal side and the the cultural side and on the support for the for the girls and and the bringing families and communities around this issue, that really started to to change the dynamic and it and it's something that changed the dynamic here mm -hmm. as well. I mean, some of the the amazing organisations who've worked on forced and child marriage in in the UK and and these brave brave activists who've talked out uh, talked um, about the the situations that they faced. Um, about their siblings who were killed um, because of being forced into marriage and then um, facing honor killings. That's what's really started to shift. And of course, having amazing legal minds to, to really think about which bit of the law can, can we focus in on so that we can shift it and we can create greater protections for, for people all over. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, in the in the UK, especially when we were working on this campaign, or I say the UK, it's England and Wales, Scotland actually didn't sign up to the bill. Um, but it really was a coalition of organisations that came together to make this change a reality. So it was called the Pauline Latham MP Bill. It was one of the, uh, bit of the I think the last bill she's championing before she retires. Um, and she dedicated years to this. And I thought it was so funny after it actually happened, people were saying, well done, you know, God, you did that quickly. And we are thinking, you know, it took years. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you just see the success and the win at the end. Uh, but this is, you know, happening pre-COVID and the government continued to push back and back and back and we were a coalition of um, many women's rights organizations as you mentioned the public health perspective is also really important to push from all angles and survivors are really at the heart of the campaign and speaking about the impact of child marriage on their lives and the next generation how they didn't want their children or grandchildren to potentially have to suffer a child marriage and people may think well surely again that's not happening here and I know from cases that I've worked on um, through the family courts that you know, I've worked on cases where there has been children at risk of being forced into a marriage, uh, British children either here or potentially taken back um, abroad uh, to other countries um, under the pretense, for example, of going to a funeral and then arrive and realize actually they're going to be forced into a marriage. And we call it forced marriage, but actually it's, it is child marriage. And there is that distinction in, in some respects between them because of course there's no choice when one is a child and it, it reinforces as well doesn't it the fact that um, you are a child until you're the age of 18 you know society and times have moved on now and having that free access to education and it being a fundamental right for girls is now enshrined in law and understanding that that is integral um, for girls so I, I think that it was an enormous campaign and a significant shift um, and I, one of the other campaigns that 
um, I worked on along with Dexter Dias, um, Casey, is the campaign around FGM, female genital mutilation. And uh, that we worked on for a good number of years and introduced um, a novel legal remedy, female genital mutilation protection orders. Um, and the purpose of that was to prevent FGM before it had happened. Because, of course, one of the problems of criminal law is that it's looking after the event has already taken place. And we wanted to stop that uh, in its tracks. And so by having these orders, for example, to prevent a girl from going abroad where she could be cut um, or uh, prevent her from having contact with somebody who may pose a risk in performing FGM, was um, absolutely integral. In fact, um, we've had over 500 of those orders have been made since the legislation came into force at the end of 2015. I've worked on a number of cases involving at-risk girls, and it's, it's thought that over 130,000 girls are at risk of FGM each year in this country alone. So to, to think that that law can protect a good number of at-risk girls is, I think, a phenomenal achievement and a testament to the rights of human rights lawyers and campaigners uh, in coming together. And, and, of course, survivors who put their head above the parapet and spoke about their own experiences um, and subjugation in terms of FGM as children. Uh, and Leila Hussein was um, a phenomenal campaigner and very much at the forefront of, of that campaign. It's um, th the other thing that I think was was quite interesting was um, the coalition between campaigners who were working on FGM, campaigners who were working on on forced marriage, campaigners working on child marriage, and campaigners working on broader sexual reproductive uh, mm -hmm. health and rights, and really starting to to break down the, the barriers um, between some of these issues and recognize that a lot of them stem from um, a focus on controlling women, controlling girls, controlling bodies, um, and, and that actually you can't really, from a, from a long-term societal perspective, you can't really tackle any one of them unless you're really trying to, to change the way that, um, that girls and women are perceived around, around the world. And I think that's, that's also started to, to help shift some of these, these conversations. And because yeah. um, again, early on, there was um, when, when we'd go up and, and talk to people about, about child marriage, they'd be like, oh, well, that's a niche issue. Um, you know, maybe, maybe this month we'll talk about this and the next month we'll talk about FGM and, then, um, and then, then later we'll do, I don't know, we'll do children's nutrition or something. Um, and actually trying to break down those, those barriers was, was something that was really, really important. Mm. Um, I, I think one of the things when, when we were chatting um, also that we're trying to think was like, what are some of these lessons that we can take from these kinds of campaigns into the, the conversation about, about abortion. And one of the things for me that brings me hope is um, looking at the global picture around abortion rights, because even though there's this horrendous news from, from the US, if we look uh, over the last 20 odd, odd years, there has been progress um, in more than 30 countries and countries like Mexico and Argentina and South Korea. Um, and, and really more of a recognition that actually if you want to um, prevent unsafe abortions, you should actually make abor legal and safe abortions more easily accessible. Um, and it sounds sort of self-evident when you say it, but, but it, it's actually a really powerful thing to start to, to think about because um, it... Uh, I think WHO has estimated that there's about 73 million abortions taking place every year around the world, um, and that between 5 and 13% of maternal deaths are related to complications from unsafe abortions. So it really is this, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that unsafe abortions are killing women around mm. the world and that tackling this issue does need people coming together and really voicing their opposition to discriminatory laws. And I think that's also one thing that we've started to see 
in the US context is um, recently in some midterm uh, elections, the, the issue of abortion was on a number of, of ballots in a, in, a, in a number of states. And uh, it felt like for one of the, one of the first times, there was a much more open discussion about abortion and what kind of society people want to, to live in. Um, and that until now, it, it felt like it was, oh, it was a bit more of a private issue. We don't really, whatever our personal feelings about it are, we don't really want to, to talk too much about it. And, and I think that shift has also been something that's, mm. that's been in, interesting to, to see. Yeah, I think that one of the, um, at the, the heart of the second wave feminist movement was making the private political and putting what happens behind closed doors into the public sphere and encouraging people to, especially women, to speak about what happens behind closed doors, domestic abuse and rape um, taking place. Um, and we know, of course, the high numbers of women that are in this country alone, one in six women will be raped or sexually assaulted. So it affects a huge number of the population and yet rape has become decriminalized in this country. But I think having those public conversations and raising awareness about it and sharing experiences and stories is so powerful. And I think one of the lessons that we've learned from these campaigns is it, they've all been survivor-led. And so by survivors speaking out about their experiences, I think it encourages you know, people in the halls of power and the echelons of power uh, to understand and take note about how important these issues are and how they can use their platform and the powers available to them to make a substantial difference to other people's lives. And it's, it's making them feel the pathos as well as rationalizing and explaining the reasons for it. But sometimes it's very frustrating to have to do that in championing the, the rights, the human rights of 51% of the population still having to make those arguments. And one of the things I was thinking about when um, we've been speaking during this conversation is how these different campaigns, the way we speak about them, is often as if they're in a vacuum or in silos rather than recognizing the joined up nature of violence against women and girls and how it's part and parcel of a bigger issue um, rather than necessarily separate campaigns. Um, I wonder if there's a way of being able to campaign almost for greater structural change. Um, that's a very big question. <laughs> uh, I think yes and um, yes and. So absolutely we need much more joined up um, campaigning on all of these issues but I think sometimes it's easier for people to grasp a very specific mm. thing whether it's a legal change whether it's a particular health issue whether it's a procedure that people are are facing rather than the big like oh we need to change everything about how um, uh, women are perceived in, in our societies. And so I think there is something about, in some ways it's almost being quite tactical about, okay, what are the, what are the issues we're going to, like as a really broad movement that wants to, to um, push for the, the rights of women and girls, what are the issues that we're going to focus on now that may be able to capture the attention of a certain part of the population um, and then uh, but all recognize that it's not just because we're talking about abortion now doesn't mean that um, the other issues are not important it just means that that's a thing that people can get their their, their head around and, um, and and focus on and I guess also the other thing um, it's almost a bit of a counter to what I just I just said, but um, <laughs> is sometimes with campaigning we get so hung up on um, changing the law mm. um, or on changing a particular uh, constraint that we don't necessarily think about how people can can really uh, that those rights can be fulfilled in different ways. And so you know, on the abortion mm. case, one, one um, Zambia has very liberal laws around um, access to abortion, but um, 
very few doctors. Mm. So for most women who are living in rural uh, areas, even though legally they're allowed to have an abortion, um, they may not be able to find a provider. And, um, and so just because the law is in place doesn't mean that um, women and girls are able to, to access, yeah. access those. And then in, in other contexts, um, it may be that, that society is, um, is holding people back. So India recently um, uh, m made it very explicit, the Supreme Court made it very explicit that unmarried women were allowed to have abortions. Mm. Um, but the, when you talk to um, women's rights organizations and campaigners, they're, they're very happy that this ruling has come into to force, but many of them say, well, that's, that's the very first step <laughs> of, a, of a very long journey because actually for a young woman, particularly who does not have the, the financial means to, to go to a clinic, etc., finding a, a healthcare provider who will be sympathetic, um, who will not be judgmental, mm. um, who, and, and who will support her in that decision, there's still quite a long way to, to go. It reminds me of Northern Ireland as well, because mm. of course there have been real uh, seismic shifts in Northern Ireland in terms of abortion. So abortion is decriminalized up to 12 weeks now in Northern Ireland, but the problem is, there are not uh, nearly enough abortion providers on the ground so that women can actually access that right when they need it. Um, although in terms of the actual crafting of the law, in some respects it's more progressive now than England, Wales and Scotland. But you know, you're absolutely right that the, the law may look a certain way, but how does it actually work in practice? Um, and I suppose that's one aspect of looking at the law either through a microscope when you analyze it or looking at the law as a social science. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is one of the, the issues when it comes to legislation and campaigning for legal change, that it can sometimes result, of course, in unintended consequences. Um, if you think about the law as a structure being primarily, as Catherine McKinnon would say, white and male and enforcing a very similar privileged point of view in the way that it's, even if it's not drafted necessarily in that way, the way that it's interpreted. Um, and as a result, some women may be reluctant to use um, the police or contact the police when they need uh, support or they need protection or services because they may feel they'll experience gender-based discrimination or racism, especially women of color, of course, report that. Um, and so it's important that when looking at the law, we look at the apparatus and the implementation around it to make sure that the discrimination is not being reproduced in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously one of the arguments um, that feminists are, are very anti-carceral punishment for gender-based violence. And I, you know, I understand and empathize to an extent as to why, from a theoretical perspective, but in practice working with women and girls that have suffered male violence and do seek to use the law uh, to bring about justice for them. For some people, that whole process can be cathartic. And you know, when the law works for them, um, and they see that there has either been uh, punishment imposed in terms of in a criminal context or in a family context that they and their children have been protected or in a civil context they've been awarded damages because they were raped, then the law in effect has upheld their rights and they feel protected by the state. Um, and then for others, of course, with, as I mentioned, the decriminalization of rape, others feel that the process can further re-victimize and re-traumatize them, particularly if they are disbelieved by the police or they found the whole process extremely grueling. So there, I think there are a, you know, a variety of different angles sometimes to look at campaigns and some of the barriers when accessing the law mm. um, as it still currently stands. Um, and I'm sure, you know, we, when we were speaking earlier about working on campaigns in different cultural contexts, you mentioned how you have to change the campaigns to fit particular environments and recognizing some of those challenges. Yeah, I think that's where um, making sure that the, the campaigns are really led by the um, survivors from those communities, people who really f come from the communities that they're trying to change, that makes all the difference because they know what arguments are going to, to create change 
in the places where where they live, and uh, what's going to create change in their with their neighbors and and in their their legal systems as mm. as well, um, and that's where having that that community focus and the national focus, but then also finding ways to connect across countries has been really powerful. I mean, I remember having some um, some meetings where uh, people from Cameroon, people from Mexico, people from India were all talking to each other about how they were working with um, religious leaders in their communities. Completely different religions, completely different context, but they were using a lot of the same tactics and were able to, to share what was working for them, and that made all of their, their work significantly stronger. And that's something that, that it's really exciting to see when that, that, that is able to, to happen. I think also that, that kind of global solidarity is hugely important when we see major setbacks in certain parts of, of the world. Um, you know, some of these campaigns take a really, really long time to, to produce um, positive results. And being able to see that positive change happening somewhere else, even when you're seeing things go backwards where you are living, that can give you hope, that can give you the sense of, okay, it is worth continuing the slog, it is worth um, focusing on this because they've been able to change it in a, a, a really difficult situation the conditions will come for us to change it as well. I realize we've been talking for, for a while. At what point do you want us to, to pause and... Yeah, shall we? Shall we? In 45 minutes, yeah. yes. Okay. <laughs> so happy to take any questions. Um, you want to start over there and then we'll just get people with the cameras, with the mics. Thank you for... Thank you for a fantastic discussion. I'm not sure that this is working, so I'll just yell at you. <laughs> uh, so you talked about some of the sort of larger changes that need to occur to see the, la the law get changed, mm. such as sort of a, a general awareness of what's going on behind closed doors or what's not really talked about, as well as sort of instilling a larger sense of female autonomy and the sort of rights over body and such. But could you talk me through a little more about the actual technical steps in changing a law in somewhere like the UK? What would it actually take to decriminalize abortion? abortion? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, there's actually uh, been um, an amendment uh, table to the Bill of Rights later this month by a member of parliament to enshrine abortion as a fundamental human right, access to it. So that's one step towards acknowledging that. But I mean, in terms of actually the change it would make, of course, it wouldn't necessarily make a dent in the Abortion Act 1967 or the Offence Against the Person Act or child destruction as another piece of legislation. So what would it actually take? Um, at the moment, there is, a, again, a, a coalition, um, an enormous number of organizations that are working on the decriminalization of abortion, including abortion providers, those working in public health, in the feminist and women's rights spaces as well. Um, and there are some survivors that are um, working alongside in this campaign, those that have been criminalized. Um, and so working together, um, having roundtables, helping to draft legislation, um, those briefing the media, women willing to speak out about what's happened to them and getting it on the agenda is part of that. And I'm setting up a not-for-profit organization called Right to Equality, uh, which is in partnership with the Good Law Project. And the purpose of that organization is to change the law for women and girls. And one of their campaigns is to decriminalize abortion. So we're hoping that... Um, now is the right time to get that off the ground, um, given the enormous amount of sensitization around this issue. A question up over here. Um, thank you very much indeed um, for sharing all the information that you have shared. And as somebody who didn't realize that women were being criminalized for abortion in this country, I am absolutely horrified. And I suppose my, my question was, who is bringing the cases against these women? And I'm sorry, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a very well averse, but you know, if somebody's um, abortion has gone wrong and they have ended up in hospital 
and they need medical care or you know who is bringing the cases and is it that the system is wrong outside of it is it young vulnerable people who are being made even more vulnerable yeah. is there an, a racist element to it is it being brought by men of certain organizations do you have that answers to those questions um, I think in terms of thinking about it as, as a pattern, as you're suggesting, we probably don't have the evidence to be able necessarily to support that. But from some of the cases that I've looked into and some of the women that we've been working with, um, what's happened is they've arrived and presented at the hospital, as I've described, and as I say, one woman that had a miscarriage in the bath um, and then arrived at an, in a hospital in a very uh, distressed state, as I said, already vulnerable because she asserts she was a, an abuse victim. Um, and then once she arrived in hospital, um, medical practitioners... I don't know if doctors or nurses, but they contacted the police. And so the police arrived at the hospital um, and then interviewed her, took her to the police station, continued uh, to interview her, and the case was then passed to the CPS. And they decided that there was enough evidence and it was in the public interest to prosecute her. So that, that's what happened in terms of in that context. Can I, uh, can I just bring in a, there's a few questions coming in online, and, and please, if you're online, do, do put in more. Um, but can I bring in one of these just to, to check up on something which, which I think you said? Um, so one of our, our regular people, anonymous attendee, says, <laughs> did I hear correctly yeah. that rape has been decriminalised? If this is true, what implication does it have for the woman who has been raped? Thank you. That's a, that's a big question. Um, so that is what Vera Baird, for example has said Dame Vera Bear Casey, who is the Victims Commissioner in this country. She has referred to the decriminalisation of rape, as has the London's Victims Commissioner, Claire Waxman, um, who have equally spoken out about uh, the numbers of women that have dropped out from police reports of rape. 40% of women who have reported rape have then gone on to drop out for a variety of reasons. They've described the process being extremely traumatising when they report to the, uh, the police and that there is a culture of disbelief. Um, they've described um, how grueling and graphic the whole process is of, um, and, and also, of course, the delays and the backlog in cases. And then if you look at the numbers of prosecutions, it's less than 2,000 in one year. And as I say, one in six women will suffer sexual assault and rape. Um, it's a significant number that have experienced violence against women and girls. And yet, if you look at what's actually happening in terms of the prosecutions and conviction rates, it's appalling. It's absolutely dismal. And there was a joint inspectorate report by the police and the CPS uh, which looked at the handling of rape complaints. And some women in those um, case reports described going through the process uh, of a prosecution as actually being worse than the rape itself. So very harrowing, powerful testimony. And the women that I've represented in the family courts, many of them have been through the criminal justice system. So in virtually all of the cases, there will be police reports of disclosure um, in terms of what they've been through. And some of the responses from the police as to why they haven't taken this case further have just been appalling. For example, saying that there's no CCT evidence of the alleged rape, even though if what's happened behind closed doors, it'd be surprising if there was CCTV evidence. There was no third party evidence. Again, not, not surprising perhaps, given it's between two individuals. And one of the issues is when it comes to partnership rape, especially, or marital rape, um, it seems it's a higher uh, threshold that's applied when it comes to investigating uh, those complaints as opposed to perhaps the so-called stranger rape and the way that it's understood. And we see those myths play out in the media. And then, of course, there are rape myths and rape tropes and stereotypes um, that continue to be peddled, uh, not just, of course, in the criminal justice system or the family justice system, but in society as a whole uh, and within the media on a daily basis. And it's something where I think we all need to look at ourselves and the language that we use when speaking about these types of, of issues. Thank you. Um, there's more coming online, but I think there's a question up here. Can we get a... Thank you both for 
sharing all of your um, insights. Um, I'm interested to hear um, about your experiences with advocacy and particularly whether you found that that um, advocacy requires there to be some strategic thought about the order or the priority that you're going to give to all of these different and intersecting issues and whether you've sort of experienced it as something where you've got a limited attention span of, of, an, audi of an external audience that you've got to sort of pick your moment, pick your issue or whether you find that it's like a snowballing effect where you sort of hook people in and they're suddenly interested and they're then interested in the next thing. And I'm also particularly interested in hearing what you have to say about the, the role of art and culture in advocacy. I'm thinking about um, Prima Facie being mm. um, a play that's sort of brought to light some of the issues with, with um, pursuing prosecutions in, in sexual offences. Um, sure. Um, so I'm happy to, to start on the on the advocacy point. Um, I think with with any advocacy, you you know you need to think about who it is you're trying to influence to do what, and what are the what are the messages, and who are the messengers that are most likely to to create that that change. Um, when you're looking at the broader context of women's rights, um, it's it gives you a a lot more tools to to be able to to focus on to 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 hook people in in different in different ways um, and and so I think absolutely if you want to change um, uh, change laws change hearts and minds you you do have to have that clear headed look at what's catching people's attention um, and then go in now f on the issue of child marriage, one of the things uh, there was uh, in sort of 2012, 2013, there was quite a lot of global interest on the issue. At that time, um, in the UK, Prime Minister David Cameron hosted uh, in 2014 a, um, a big girl summit mm. on FGM and on child marriage. And so for quite a few people, that was sort of that was a, a hook that we knew we had to, to use um, on a personal level. Uh, it, it was scheduled for the day I was supposed to give birth. So, <laughs> I, remember it. so, so I, remember, I remember the day well. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it caused the last few months of my pregnancy to be a bit more hectic than I had, than I had anticipated. Um, but what it meant is that, okay, so you know you've got a moment, you know you've got people's attention, and it's thinking about what can we do to get this issue in, not just in people's attention, but what are the elements that we can put in place when people are really excited and interested in this that will have longer term impact? And so um, looking at this from a global perspective, um, it was really important for us to think about what would get into national action plans, because that was something that would then become part of the, the sort of the infrastructure of a, of a country's processes and it kind of doesn't matter if people's attention moves on to something completely different next year because the pieces are, are, are there. Mm. Um, or really trying to focus on getting commitments that have been signed up to by influential um, people with, with power that you can then hold them uh, to account on. And, and it was interesting because uh, I remember at the time we were talking, uh, again at the global level, between people who were focusing on FGM and people focusing on child marriage, on um, what should, which of these things should we do together, which of these things should we look at separately. And it was quite a clear eyed discussion about, okay, what's going to get all of these issues further along? Um, and, and sometimes that means putting your ego. Um, at the, the door and saying like, okay, we're going to take a step back on this one because the, the overall project is going to be advanced if we focus on, on, the, other, on the other piece. I think from the perspective of, of art, um, sometimes, uh, and th it took me personally quite a while to, to recognize that the things that, that made me change my mind, were, which were often like, facts and bullet pointed sheets were <laughs> were not the things that were catching other people's attention i mean one of the things that really shifted a number of conversations was when um when we hosted um these amazing photo e exhibits 
um, in different parts of, of the world and they started people uh, talking about the issue. There was some on, on child marriage, there was some on, on teenage pregnancy, and it was really kind of a stark reminder of what this actually means in people's lives and it, it really shifted the, the conversations in ways that I wouldn't have expected at all. And then on a, on a different um, perspective, when we were bringing activists together, um, creating space for them to be able to, to do like playful things together meant that um, they connected on a completely different level and ultimately formed stronger bonds and were able to, to just yeah, think a lot more creatively about what, what it is that they could do to create the, the change that they wanted to, to see. Mm. I think it's a great number of questions, but I think there's one example that I would highlight in terms of women themselves or girls themselves putting an issue on the political and public agenda. And that's a campaign that we've been working on to criminalize public sexual harassment again, along with my colleague, Dexter. Um, and that was a campaign that was pioneered by two sisters, Gemma and Maya Totten, and they set up Our Streets Now, which has gone from strength to strength. And they set that up a few years ago, themselves, uh, both at school still, and had experienced the invasive, corrosive, insidious form of public sexual harassment, just on the way to school, on the way back from school, being objectified and abused in a way that made them feel unsafe in a public space, which no girl or woman should ever have to put up with. And of course, the Istanbul Convention also makes it very clear that national governments need to address public sexual harassment. And so they made it their business to use social media and raise awareness of public sexual harassment and use their voices and their stories to encourage people to empathize with what they've experienced and for other people to say, yes, me too, this happened to me as well. And so it created a real sea change. You know, they, they really grew in terms of having a petition, uh, their Instagram presence, they're on Twitter, they did TikTok videos, they were on the BBC, there's a documentary about them, there's going to be a Channel 4 show. Uh, about public sexual harassment. Liz Truss, remember Liz Truss? <laughs> Shortest <laughs> prime minister in history, but nevertheless brilliant in the sense that her violence against women and girls strategy, of course, included one policy, but that policy was to criminalize PSH. That was her policy, which, you know, um, good, to, good on Gemma and Maya for making that happen. And of course, Plan UK as well. You know, the four of us have been working together on this over the past few years relentlessly to make this happen. And we're confident it will happen as well. It's a matter of time. Um, uh, meanwhile, Rishi Sunak promised to ban down blousing. That was his priority so that he could stop the perverts. That was what he said in his press release. Um, but anyway, uh, I digress. Um, and in terms of the... I think one of the other fundamental issues in terms of putting an issue on the agenda when it might not already be topical, one of the things that I've done, certainly as a barrister, is strategic litigation. So where I see there's an issue, I appreciate that probably Parliament's not going to do anything about it. Um, one of the examples, for instance, is, I can think of many, but um, making refuge addresses confidential. That is not enshrined in law, believe it or not. So um, I've had a number of cases where victims have fled to a refuge and the address has been discovered through court orders. Um, and as a result of that, perpetrators have tracked them down, stalked them, and in one case even abducted the child abroad. So it's caused real harm. Now, we tried to amend the domestic abuse bill to make it clear refuge addresses should be confidential. There should be a presumption of that. The government, of course, didn't support it. Um, and so now we have a guidance case before the president of the family division later this month when he is going to be looking at giving interim guidance on refuge addresses, ensuring their confidentiality. And the second example I would give is um, child contact costs. You may think, fairly trivial issue, and, and what I'm speaking about here is um, a case in which Kate Griffiths, who's a member of Parliament, 
Um, she was being raped, abused, and controlled by her husband at the time, Andrew Griffiths, who was a member of parliament. You might remember him from the news headlines. He sent sexually depraved and violent messages to two female constituents. Uh, and then that became public knowledge and was in the newspapers. Meanwhile, he was abusing his wife behind closed doors. I represented her, and we got those findings, and she fought for her right to speak about what had happened to her, and that went all the way to the Court of Appeal and back. But one of the issues in that case, and one that I'd seen as a pattern in other cases, is that rape victims like Kate, was, they were actually being ordered by the family courts to subsidize their rapists and pay towards their child contact costs in a contact center. And the reason they were having contact in a child contact center is because he is a risk to the child. And yet she was having to subsidize that financially. And I said that's another form of financial abuse and post-separation coercive control. Um, the government didn't agree, and so they didn't amend the domestic abuse bill, as it then was. So I brought um, a, a case to the High Court. I appealed the decision, and as a result, Mrs Justice Arbuthnot gave a brilliant judgment where she sets out there's a strong presumption against victims ever paying towards their abusers' contact costs, and that extends towards other financial costs that flow from family proceedings. So there are other ways of trying to deal with some of those issues that may not make headline news, but are still important. And I have a long list of them, and then I wait to tick them off when it comes <laughs> up in a case, or someone contacts me, I'll think, right, that's the point I can take. Um, and so tomorrow, um, I'm in the High Court, um, along with my leader, and the Family Court is looking at the definition of consent and rape in family law proceedings, because at the moment, there is no definition. And uh, that, well, the fact there is no definition means that there isn't anything that's been consistently applied in all judgments. And so I used the opportunity in two cases to appeal that issue. And then just finally, uh, because I know as a barrister, I do go on and on. <laughs> um, but the, the play that you mentioned, um, Primey Facey, I thought was absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely. She got a standing ovation, uh, Jodie Comer, and I'm delighted it's going to be on Broadway as well. And it was a really good opportunity, I think, to change people's mindsets about rape. And I think particularly the whole thing, of course, was a monologue. But at the end, she gave this really powerful speech about how she, as a working-class woman, had come to the bar as a barrister, and I won't give away what happens, but she'd come to the bar as a barrister, and she believed in the integrity of the system and the rule of law, and she was so proud, and her mum was proud of her, for her to be able to be in court and represent um, you know, alleged perpetrators and complainants and so forth. And then she spoke about how broken the justice system is and how it further... Uh, re-traumatizes and abuses women because it, the law is enacted from a male perspective and excludes women's lived experiences of violence and excludes their perspective, particularly from an intersectional feminist viewpoint as well. But I think that's, uh, just to, to add to that, I think that's where it's so important to have, um, you know, different faces and mm. different voices in some of these traditional structures like the um, like law, like journalism as well. Um, you know, people to tell the stories that are important to large swathes of the population, but haven't been important to the people who were traditionally the people who decided what comes onto the, the news. And so there, that also helps to open up the, the, the conversations. There are lots of questions coming in. I'll try, I'll do my best to get to people. Um, so th there are a couple just in this section. So... Um, but wh while we're getting there, can I just ask a couple of health-related ones um, from online? So Lola Ch Chirico asks, how can the healthcare sector effectively support this movement, both as individual practitioners and as whole organisations? Um, I'd say, w um, so from a, a global perspective, uh, sometimes the, the law, anti-abortion laws target healthcare professionals, and mm. there's been a, a situation... Um, recently in Poland where there was a regression in uh, anti-abortion laws where one of the exceptions um, was taken out. But what has happened is that um, a number of, of doctors are, are really, really quite worried about um, performing an abortion, even when it is 
for one of the reasons where, where it is still allowed, because there's murkiness around the, the law, the definitions are not super clear, and, and so they are worried about going to prison for, for many years, and so they're likely to, to step back. And I think that's where um, having uh, you know, the, the uh, national medical associations sort of come together and take a stand on some of these can, can help protect individual doctors uh, in certain contexts. I think, I mean, from, from the examples you were giving, the, the hospitals were active participants in, mm. in re-traumatizing some of the, the women. So maybe there's something about, um, about really trying to, to target that leadership as well to, to think about their role in supporting women and girls in these, in these situations. Yeah, just say if you want to get involved, contact BPAS, um, MSI, abortion rights, um, and say that you want to get involved in that movement. And I'm sure they'd be very happy to have you on board. There, there are lots of questions. So there were two over here, which I might try and take, and then I'll have a look over here and then move back. So, so the, per the first one was following on. So could you hold the microphone? Oh, sorry, to your yeah, mouth. Uh, yeah, the first question was, well, two brief ones, but the following on from that lady's question over there opposite me, um, was th with the, the the case of the girl you were describing, wasn't that a breach of the doctor-patient confidentiality then referring that on to the police? And the second one was, um, are there any plans to increase the access to uh, reducing the, the reasons why women do have to uh, seek uh, abortion in this country? So in terms of are there plans to reduce or, or relook at the justifications for women having abortions, um, the, I, I think that there's constantly scrutiny um, of the 1967 Act by MP Stella Creasy MP being uh, the person who's very much at the heart and the figurehead of this um, movement. But I don't think there's been anything in terms of a movement necessarily that's likely to result in any change in that direction at the moment. And I think the approach seems to be to seek full decriminalization rather than necessarily just tackling a few of the exemptions which allow for the abortion to take place. So um, I, I, I think that's perhaps the right, the right decision um, at the moment. And in terms of the patient-doctor confidentiality issue, I know that that's one of the concerns that BPAS and MSI um, have been looking at, but I think that from what I gather from having the conversations with them, um, when medical practitioners have reported to the police, the reason they've done that is they believe that that woman has committed a criminal offence, and so they think they have a duty to report that to the police. And then the fact the police are investigating women are being prosecuted suggests that, well, yes, I mean, it, it, it is a crime, and women are potentially going to prison for that. And I know that um, Dr. Jonathan Lord, for example, who's been quoted a number of times, he is at MSI and he has been a vocal advocate for change in terms of some of those issues and, and, and heightened awareness raising and training for nurses, midwives and doctors. Can we take a second question from that block and then I'll um, do some from here and then keep dancing around. So, um, so we spoke a lot about um, how when women are prosecuted, that that can be a re-traumatizing process. But in strategic litigation, sometimes the lead plaintiff can also have a very nasty experience, and Jane Roe or Norman Corby um, had a very troubled relationship to her role in that case, as did the child who was born as a result as well. And so I wonder, um, even when we're potentially able to justify you know, putting people on the spot like that, knowing that case law might change and help many more women, H how can we better support and protect people who are put forward in these activist legal cases? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, in terms of the strategic litigation cases that I've been involved in, those cases have often already been going on for quite a long time. So it's not a case of, women is necessarily being put at the forefront of this um, immediately. So the example that I gave, say, of refuge addresses or the presumption 
of not subsidising your abusers' contact. Those cases have been rolling on for so long and it was an opportunity to make law that women themselves wanted to do as well because they had experienced that violation through the law. And so they were very keen to make sure that it didn't happen to anybody else and it was made clear in case law that what had happened to them was a form of abuse that was allowed to have take place, or you could say perpetrated by the court system itself. So, I, I mean, and certainly in terms of the women that I've represented, I haven't seen um, the negative effects that, you know, uh, obviously we saw in some of the other uh, more high-profile cases. And, and in those cases as well, apart from the Kate Griffiths, uh, case, the women are anonymous, um, so their identities are not known publicly. And the same in terms of the strategic litigation case I mentioned in terms of the Abortion Act, um, the women would not be named, so they would be anonymous. And in this country, we don't have ambulance chasing in the sense of, you know, looking and having, you know, adverts on the internet, please contact me if you want to bring a case of this nature. These are women that are often already aggrieved by the situation and what has happened to them. And so contact people like BPAS or MSI or other organizations looking for legal redress. So they're often already perhaps aware of their legal rights or affronted by the fact they've had to pathologize themselves, such as the lady that I mentioned who didn't want to have a child and then had to give a mental health justification. Uh, the fact that she was in her 40s and educated and aware of the fact that that was wrong and wanted to challenge it perhaps says something as well about the types of plaintiffs that then we end up with, not necessarily a reflection of the cross-section of our society and all of the different intersectional inequalities women are experiencing and more marginalised and vulnerable women, the perhaps more highly educated. So, of course, that's another issue. We're beginning to run out of time, so mm -hmm. I, I'll, I will take s as many questions as we can fit in, but they could be brief questions and perhaps brief answers. Um, over here, and then I think there was one over here. Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks so much. I have so many questions, but I'll uh, keep it to one. Uh, you mentioned several cases of uh, medical abortion. Um, and by the way, I love uh, how you uh, characterized the spirit in the, the US that people were shocked by losing Roe and that um, um, that that really inspired people the same way that the death of uh, uh, Halapanavir in Ireland maybe shocked people into mm. doing something about abortion, uh, making it more legal. Um, in the US, we expect the next battlefront to be about uh, medical abortion by mail in the states that have banned uh, abortion completely like Texas. Uh, women can still today get pills in the mail, but that might change over the next uh, uh, few months or years. Uh, but two of the cases that you mentioned um, where the women were prosecuted, they'd received pills by mail. Mm. I'm curious how that works. Are you supposed to have a Zoom meeting with physicians and then that's how you get permission? And had they just not done that? Do you want to go on the row? Um, go ahead. Um, so in, in terms of um, the, um, the, I'm not sure if you're aware of telemedicine, for instance, in this country. So now you can obtain abortion uh, medication, reproductive health care through having phone conversations with uh, medical health providers, but still you need two doctors to certify um, the fact that you can have an abortion. And that's up to... Uh, 24 weeks gestation, and Baroness Liz Sugg was a uh, pioneer of that in the House of Lords and made that happen. That was a huge change just recently uh, during COVID and has been now reinforced through um, an Act of Parliament. But um, in terms of the cases that I mentioned, I think it's a variety of situation where women have ordered or their abusive partners have ordered online abortion pills, so have not necessarily gone through an abortion provider, but have found them online. Um, and then in other situations where um, they may have contacted an abortion provider to have access to the abortion pills and have not been aware of how far gone they were and in fact were over the gestation limit. So those those were the concerns that were raised in some of those cases. Yes, but I think generally speaking, it'd be interesting to do a poll to see whether, or a vote, um, to see whether how, you know, whether the public are aware of the fact that ordering abortion pills online, not necessarily through an abortion provider, um, is actually a crime. Do people know that, I wonder? And not just a crime, you can be kept in penal servitude for life. 
I'm going to try and take a few questions together, if that's possible, just try to fit in as many. So there, there's firstly two on the front row here uh, in either order. Um, hi, thank you. I was just wondering to what extent do you think our current judiciary uh, sort of perpetuates these like women's rights issues and how far would a more intersectional judiciary actually help remedy these issues without legislative change? And can we take the second question as well so you can answer them together? Mm -hmm. It's um, just a sort of observation. You mentioned about the private and public. Um, the reason why many people will not hear from any survivors if it goes through the family court is that you are in prison, uh, threatened with imprisonment if you do at any point discuss anything that happens in the family court. So if any of you are unaware why you not, may not know half of what's gone on, it's because legally, and that is being challenged at the moment, but no one is allowed to speak as to what has happened in the family court. And who's challenging that at the moment? I can't remember. The, the, there is a, uh, there's a big boat. They were doing a big movement. Transparency <laughs> review? Y yes, it might be that. I don't, I'm not a lawyer at all. Oh, okay. I'm not a lawyer at all. I'm just saying, so when survivors, survivors such as myself and others, are told to come forward, um, we've been absolutely said, be quite clear that you could find yourself in prison. prison. Yeah, that's right. Contempt of court if you speak out. And I think that's wrong. That's my, that's my, my humble opinion. Um, in terms of the judiciary... Um, well, we know from the statistics it's largely male, pale and stale. And, um, you know, it's, it's a certain demographic of society that are reflected in the judiciary rather than the judiciary reflecting our society and the diversity that we have amongst us generally, not necessarily here at Jesus tonight, but uh, wider afield. And I'm afraid that's often reflected, I think, in the decisions that are made. And we've seen some quite harrowing decisions, especially in the family courts, including one judge who said to a mother, if she continued with her allegations of rape, then she would find herself uh, with her child adopted. Um, she was threatened to that extent. She couldn't speak, of course, about that. I went to the Court of Appeal and so forth. That was a particular judge from a particular demographic background, like many others. Uh, there was another judge, uh, also white, male, privileged, who said that a woman hadn't been raped because she didn't fight him off. Uh, and that was very recent as well. So I do think that that's extremely problematic. I think we have a long way to go. We need, we need equal, fair representation in our judiciary. And, and particularly just reflecting one of the things that you said earlier about there not being a consistent definition of consent and rape, it also puts even more power in the hands of, of people who just aren't even aware of their own prejudices um, mm. and, and take certain decisions that are then going to have this huge impact on people's lives. Can we take our last two questions? There'll be one right at the back. Then I think we might see if there's anybody from the judiciary in the room who'd like to have the final question. Thank you. I, I'd just like to take a moment on persecutors um, how, and how, how frequently you see the, the, the persecutors. Um, and that, that, you know, you were talking about how it's the, the legal, changing the legal and the heart and the in the brain and how often you find that changing the legal is changing how the persecutors view themselves and actually what, what proportion of them are viewing themselves in a light of this was something I did that, um, that I, I know is, is something that is wrong and what proportion aren't even aware, both in this country and you know uh, elsewhere. Thank you, and then finally right, right at the front here. And then I'll ask both of you to, to respond, but also make any final comments you wanted to make. Right, well, thank you for what you do, basically, both of you, the work you do. <clears throat> the question I've got is, in these campaigns, where are the men? What are the men doing? And I think one of the issues we've got is that when we've got campaigns about women's rights, we need a, a shift, a shift of, of concept about it, a paradigm shift, that the idea that women's rights are ghettoized, I think, is, is, is really destructive. And we need to reinforce, request the idea that women's rights are human rights. And that, certainly with FGM, was absolutely critical 
we're lobbying both in both houses of parliament just to emphasize this isn't just an issue about women or children it's a human rights issue yeah mm -hmm. go ahead um yeah, I mean, of course, it's, it is a human rights issue. And I think that's right, because you are, it is ghettoized. Whenever you speak about these issues, it's sort of pigeonholed as a women's issue um, and is sidelined and marginalized when it comes to any aspect of it, whether it's changing the law, having debates in parliament, or even funding for women's refuges. And we need to see it as a, you know, an issue that affects everybody in society. You know, the patriarchy is oppressive to women, but it's very harmful to men as well. And I think that feeds into the question of where are the men in this room and you know, in this conversation? And I think it, it's a question of being able to tap into uh, the 50 or 49% of the population. And perhaps you'd be a better person to answer that question as to how we do that. But we've got to do that. We have got to do that. We have, I think, perhaps highlighting why the patriarchy is harmful for men in terms of toxic masculinity as well and, and other issues of that nature. I think people nodding is probably one way of doing that. And we've seen some really strong campaigns um, from men and uh, particularly sports figures, I'm afraid to say, thinking about the idea of the alpha male and trying to turn that on its head and speaking about your emotions, emotional intelligence and so forth is another important aspect of that. And in terms of the question about where the perpetrators believe that they are in fact perpetrators, understand what their behavior, I think was the question. Um, I have never cross-examined a perpetrator who didn't think they were a victim, ever. They always think that they are. I don't think I've ever seen anybody who has actually, not only, even in some cases, including the Griffiths case, acknowledged the abuse or some of the abuse that had been perpetrated, but then sought to blame her, what we call Darvo, deny, attack, reverse, victim, offender. And we saw that in the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard case, where in the high court she was found to have been a victim of 12 of 14 domestic abuse incidents. She is a victim. Um, and yet we saw what happened in the Virginia court in the US and in wider social media trial by TikTok. And the court had just become a playground to continue that abuse. And her does now become a euphemism or a slur to suggest that all women lie about rape. Just to, to pick up on the point about where are the, the men, I think it's, a, it's an incredibly important point. I mean, one of the, the things on, uh, on the, on, with Girls Not Brides that was incredibly important was that one of the, the first people to speak out on this, this issue was Archbishop Des Desmond Tutu, <coughs> who um, spoke very publicly about the fact that, first, he had never thought of child marriage being a problem in Africa. Um, and that he was absolutely devastated that this was happening to the children of, of his continent. Um, and that for him, when he learned more about it, uh, it was an issue that he wanted to, to tackle with the same ferocity that he had used to tackle apartheid. And I think that mm -hmm. sort of opened up the conversation for a number of other men to start coming into to the discussion. The other thing about working in, in coalition that's been really amazing was is to see the number of, um, of activists who have really focused on trying to, to tackle um, the, these ideas of toxic masculinity and, and really trying to, to hold open conversations with, with men in their communities about what it is that they want for their future as well um, and what is it that they might be able to do differently. So we've got some amazing activists in Pakistan, in Kenya, who are really trying to, to work with boys and men um, on what their role is in a, a different kind of, of society and trying to, to really break down this idea that if women have more rights, then men have fewer rights. And I think that mm. ultimately is often where some of the men's rights activists um, come, come from, where they, they really feel like this is a zero-sum game and that if, um, if, if women gain, then men automatically lose. And there's something really destructive about that framing. And yeah. um, it's exciting to see um, some men taking up that mantle and, and trying to, to have those conversations with their, their peers and there's space for loads more to, to be joining in those, those discussions. 
Thank you very much, Charlotte Lakshmi, for joining us to talk about such important issues, the things that have been done already, and just the huge amount that there still is to do. So um, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this evening's event. We have more coming up um, on many other subjects. Next week, we're talking about boy actors in early modern England, a slightly different subject, I admit. And then the week after that, on the Tuesday, we have uh, the, uh, the film Hostile, about the hostile immigration environment with Sunita Gale, who will be uh, talking about that film afterwards. So I hope to see you at those and much more in the next year and to come. Thank you very much for being with us.